All right, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to have you with us. Um, my name is Brian Ganter, and I am the uh, Assistant Program Manager at the Center for Creative Photography. Um, all month, we have been celebrating family photographs on our social media accounts. Um, and a couple Saturdays, Saturdays ago, uh, the Center's Senior uh, Photograph Conservator, Dana Hemingway, gave an incredibly um, informative a uh, lengthy presentation on the identification and preservation of photographic prints you have in your family's collection. Um, a recording of that live stream can be found on the center's YouTube page. We'll be sure to place a link uh, to the video in the chat if you're interested. And tonight, uh, Trisha Patterson from the Harvard Library joins us to discuss why personal digital archiving is important for everyone, how digital materials can be more at risk than physical ones, and she'll offer guidance on format, storage, and organization. Before going any further, I want to acknowledge that the University of Arizona sits on the original homelands of indigenous people who have stewardess, stewarded this land since time immemorial. We recognize and acknowledge the people, culture, and history that make up our community. I would also like to extend my sincerest thanks to our members and members of the director circle. Events uh, like this are made possible due to your generous support. So thank you so very much. Um, if you are a member, please consider joining us for a Members Wellness Wednesday. There's one right after this event. Um, they're held five to six Arizona time each Wednesday. It's a web-based series of wellness sessions hosted by Regina Armenta of Yoga is Art. The series focuses on breathing techniques for relaxation, gentle movements uh, in the body to increase blood flow and healing, and a guided meditation to promote uh, mental stability in a time of uncertainty. You need to have a separate registration um, and a, a totally different session um, will take place after this event. So you'll have to go to a different Zoom meeting but we'll place in the chat, um, uh, if you're interested in joining, um, we'll place that information in the chat. Additionally, if you're interested in supporting the center by becoming a member, we will place a link in the chat to our members page. So a little bit uh, about tonight's format. Trisha will lecture for the first 30, 40 minutes. This will be followed by a question and answer portion. We ask that you please use the chat uh, to ask your questions. If you don't see the chat button, you have to um, hover your mouse over the bottom portion of your Zoom window, and then it, it will pop up. Additionally, excuse me, please be sure to mute your microphones and also select the speaker view option using the icon in the upper right portion of your screen. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Trisha Patterson is a digital preservation analyst at Harvard Library, where she champions communication with the future by ensuring long-term stewardship and usability of Harvard's uh, digital historical assets. She supports programmatic activities for the digital repository, web and email archiving, digital forensics, emulation, and other related enterprises across the library. Prior to joining Harvard University, she was a National Digital Stewardship Resident at MIT Libraries, where she researched and documented digital preservation workflows. Trisha has served as a coordinator for the SAA Research Forum and inaugural NDSR Advisory Group member, and she co-developed and instructs an SAA DAS course on email archiving. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Trisha. I'm gonna turn things over to you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I just realized that I gave you a lot of acronyms for my intro. <laughs> SAA is just the Society of American Archivists to clarify that. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to um, share with everyone here tonight or this afternoon, this evening on this topic. It's really heartening to me to know that people are aware that their digitized and born digital photos and memories are vulnerable and that you're here interested in strategies to preserve their permanence. Oh, there we go. 
Uh, I wanted to begin by thanking the Center for Creative Photography for inviting me here to advocate and educate on personal digital archiving today, especially uh, Brian and Meg, uh, Meg Jackson Fox, who's right below Brian on my screen, uh, for coordinating this program. And a huge thank you to uh, Senior Conservator Dana Hemingway for kicking off the conversation on preserving your family photos and her wonderful program from two Saturdays ago, which I was able to watch on the center's YouTube channel. This link isn't actually helpful unless you're there typing in all the things, but um, Brian said he was going to be linking to it. And uh, I wanted to call out the YouTube that that's there because as many of you are probably already aware, it's really full of some wonderful recorded programs from the center. And I loved uh, Dana's program. It was so informative. So this is just a quick uh, overview of what I'll be covering over the next 30 to 40 minutes or so before we open it up for questions and discussion. Um, I feel like if you're gonna talk anyone's ear off <laughs> about something for 40 minutes, it's important to start by establishing why it's significant in the first place. So I'm gonna begin by just talking a little bit about the impact of properly preserving your digital history. I'll also review some of the risks that digital photos and other media are vulnerable to. And then I'm going to lay out some good practices and tips that you can employ while digitizing your physical photo collections and memories, um, followed by how to ensure the long-term sustainability of your digitized and born digital memories. Because digitization isn't digital preservation itself, it's a step towards it. Um, finally, I'll finish with some recommended resources for if you're interested in learning more after this evening, and then we'll get into the Q&A, and I have got, I've got a handful of really great pre-submitted questions, and then um, we'll have the chat open for other questions as they come up. So... Cultural heritage institutions, such as the Center for Creative Photography or Harvard Library, where I work, um, you know, anything from small community archives to huge academic and government libraries and archives have been aware of and engaging in digital preservation since the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, but despite being such a familiar issue for these institutions, the general public are still largely unaware of what digital preservation and personal digital archiving are and how it impacts them. You know, the majority of people of any age have digital files, often tons of photographs and perhaps audio tracks and, you know, Word documents. And people should know that their digital memories are vulnerable and that there are very achievable steps that they can take to properly save these files. There is this concern by historians and technologists that there's going to be an historical black hole um, in the moment when we shifted from creating content or into creating content digitally because for centuries we had long cultivated practices around preserving physical artifacts. But as digital objects began proliferating, we assumed that they would just kind of exist in perpetuity. Um, an example offhand is, you know, email itself surfaced as a method of communication back in the 1970s and has um, somewhat sadly <laughs> largely supplanted physical letter writing. But email archiving and preservation, even in huge institutions um, like Harvard Library, is still largely in its infancy. Uh, so if you can imagine that, you can imagine how much we have already lost. So by learning and practicing some basic good digital preservation of your personal digital history, your photographs and websites and videos and documents, obviously you'll be able to ensure your own access and usability of your memories over your lifetime, but you'll also be able to ensure that future generations will have access to those memories. You know, if you want to be able to hand on those memories to your children or grandchildren, the way that postcards and letters and photographs have been handed down to us, you'll be able to support the historical record in that way. And, um, and really one of my favorite parts of preservation, the way that <laughs> when I'm really bored typing on my computer and I'm just like, oh, I feel really like I'm really in the judges of my work. I like to remind myself that preservation, both physical and digital, is communicating with the future. And I suddenly feel like I'm in a sci-fi novel. So physical items are very fragile 
um, as you heard <laughs> in Dana's talk, if you attended that. Um, but within the correct preservation conditions, uh, correct housing and temperature and humidity, many can survive for decades or centuries. Digital objects are actually very fragile. <laughs> And they require more regular intervention because in order to read or see a digital object, you can't just pick it up. It is uh, dependent on an entire ecosystem of support. They are encoded files, you know, a photograph or a document, it's an encoded file. And to read that file or see that file, it requires software to open it. And that software has to be compatible with the operating system that you have on your computer. And that operating system has to be installed on a compatible piece of hardware. So this is just, <laughs> I can't even believe I found this photo. This is a photo of mine from, um, <laughs> 2007, and it's a tragic vestige of a storage media failure that happened to me when I was studying abroad in, in 2007 in Moscow, and I was uploading all my digital photos to my laptop, um, and right at the end of the trip, my computer crashed, and they couldn't retrieve anything, and this is uh, all I have left of the summer was anything that I posted on my blog spot at the time. And it's a good thing that I scraped that blog too, because eventually the blog itself uh, didn't support those old picture formats. So now when you look at it, you just see little error images, but I was able to scrape some a long time ago. So there's going to be a lot of complex information I could dig into like any subject, but uh, really tonight I'm just going to distill it down into some of the basic good digital preservation practices that you'll be able to keep in your back pocket so that that kind of stuff doesn't happen to you. So that's a big phrase. <laughs> technological obsolescence is a, a big phrase that really just boils down to the fact that technology changes constantly and quickly and something you use a lot one year might be obsolete or not used popularly uh, the next. And this phrase covers all matter of sense. Um, I included PageMaker here. Let me see if I can use that little laser. PageMaker, uh, which was a desktop publishing program introduced in way back in 1985. I used it in high school, actually, and the last version of it was released in 2004. It's now discontinued, so if you had old PageMaker files sitting around in that proprietary format, uh, you'd have to track down an old version of the software to open it up, and that software might not even be compatible and very likely wouldn't be with your modern operating system, your Mac OS Catalina or your Windows 10. Uh, storage format obsolescence like floppy disks or uh, Betamax tapes falling into disuse, I mean, you can still find them, but you have to make a real effort to find the hardware that's going to read them because eventually they aren't even actively being developed and supported anymore. And hardware obsolescence would be like, um, you can think about when you you, the plug that you used to use to like attach your external hard drive, not having a port on your new computer you know, things always changing like that, so you can't even plug things in anymore. Or uh, these old Mac desktops that are actually in Stanford libraries, really cool digital forensics lab that they have. Um, a great use case that illustrates this confluence of factors that I'm talking about that I recently heard was actually from Yale Library's Digital Preservation Unit. They had acquired a set of um, unique digitized Japanese language newspapers that were published between 1874 to 1970. So they were digitized and they were all contained on 244 CD-ROMs, uh, which are themselves becoming rapidly obsolete. I mean, are, are fairly close to obsolescence. And um, they wanted to migrate them so that they could actually access them. But each of these 244 disks could actually only be navigated by a proprietary software that held an index and the search capabilities. Um, and that software couldn't be opened on modern operating systems. So they had to track down and purchase a Japanese language version of Windows 98, so an over 20 year old operating system. And then of course, another complicating factor was being able to find the hardware that would that you could load that operating system onto that would be compatible. They actually ended up um, emulating the operating system and doing all this cool stuff. But um, it's just an illustration of if one piece of that ecosystem stops being developed or supported, the data could still be there and intact. Um, and it's not that you absolutely can't render it, but it's gonna take a lot of work and resources to do so. 
Um, at Harvard Library, I, I mentioned in the top here, whatever happened to Real Audio, Harvard Library, we recently underwent a big format migration of all of our Real Audio tracks. I don't know if anyone remembers Real Audio. Um, this was, they were introduced in 1995 and kind of became less popular by the 2010s, but we had, you know, almost 7,000 oral histories and historic speeches and original music tracks. And two decades ago, when we first digitized them, um, you know, we made a preservation master, which we were able to use to um, migrate everything. But our deliverables, what we were, what people were using to actual access these, that's my cat, I don't know if it's audible. <laughs> um, they received as real audio files. And after 20 years, we had to migrate them to MP3s. And years from now, we'll have to migrate those MP3s to a whole other format. So even if your files are intact and you have the software to open them, the hardware you're storing your stuff on is also vulnerable. Um, if you've used CDs or DVDs, which are, as I mentioned, becoming increasingly obsolete, you know that they can chip or scratch. Uh, magnetic tape drives can become demagnetized. Desktop and laptop computers, the drives that are in them, they're ultimately mechanical. So if one of their components is corrupted or disturbed, they can crash. Um, hard disk drives and solid state drives have different kinds of vulnerabilities, but the, at the end of the day, it's, it's just like a car. It might be guaranteed to last longer, but you never know when that time is going to come. And you want an insurance policy in the form of multiple copies on different storage devices, which I'll elaborate on in a little bit. Um, all drives will eventually fail, and when they do so, it's likely without warning. So a drive itself can last anywhere from a few months to over a decade, but on average, it's good to refresh after five years or so. Um, because if you wait until you realize your storage hardware is declining or it crashes, your data, your digital photos, your videos, your documents have probably already been compromised. So benefits of having other copies of One Fails You is that you can replace and regenerate it from the copies that are intact. And um, like I said, I'll discuss this in a bit more detail, uh, but if you want to diversify your storage media, don't just rely on one type. Uh, you want to broaden your risk matrix and not make yourself reliant on just one solution. Um, human error is always a risk. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about this story. Um, whether you've accidentally deleted some files and emptied the trash or threw out a thumb drive with the only set of photos from your last trip on them, we, we make mistakes. And those mistakes can lead to loss of our treasured memories. Um, the, this is actually a YouTube video and I just did a screenshot of it and I have a playlist that I can link to at the end with a bunch of really cute little digital preservation videos and this is included in it. Um, but the story of Toy Story 2 is that they were almost done. They had spent years working on this and everything was hosted on some Linux and Unix machines and someone did a command line, accidentally did a command line um, order that started deleting everything. And they said, you know, Woody's boots disappeared and Woody's hat disappeared and then layers of all this animation started disappearing and they tried to go pull the plug out of the wall and stop it and they, they pulled it and they plugged it back in and it was almost all gone. And, and all of those years of work gone and they didn't have any backups on site that they had reached the backups and deleted all of that stuff. Um, and <laughs> their saving grace was that one woman that had been working on the, on it had taken a hard drive with all of it home. And she drove to her house and gingerly packed it up and brought it back and they were able to restore the whole thing. So um, the, the importance of backups in different places, saving you from human error, can't be underlined enough. Um, a second awful story of my own, a couple of years after my first laptop crashed when I was studying abroad, you know, I was, I was out of undergrad and I was on it now. I knew I had to back up my stuff because my laptop crashed the first time. So I had copies of all my documents and photos and videos on my new laptop and I had an external hard drive. And then one night my car got broken into and um, my external hard drive was in the car. They stole the external hard drive. And then before I had a chance to replace it, my laptop crashed again. <laughs> and, 
everything was gone again. I lost, it was the second time in my life that I've lost everything on my photos and music and documents. So um, in that case, it's a, a mix of human malice and human error. And, um, and, I, and I know by, by telling all these stories, I'm really invalidating my expertise this evening. <laughs> like I'm clearly cursed by the gods of digital preservation. Um, I, I learned a lot better later. So I wanted to make sure everyone is really acquainted with the reason why you're working to protect your photos and other digital memories. You know, all the challenges we're working against. And luckily there are some really straightforward ways that you can manage your content um, to reasonably ensure longevity and permanence. So before we jump right into preserving the digital, um, I'll start with some good practices for turning your physical treasures and we'll use uh, photographs as the use case here into digital surrogates. So as Dana said in her presentation, and I quote, uh, limiting exposure to your family photographs or photograph collections helps. So one pathway to the extent of the life of your physical photographs is to digitize them. And this is also gonna increase access to your photos because you can distribute them more widely and enjoy them with friends and family and you can reprint them this way. So, let me take a sip of water. I've laid out some steps here. But before commencing this process, I'd encourage anyone undertaking this to begin by thinking intentionally through how you want to use these digital surrogates in the future, because that's going to inform some of your digitization decisions. So just some simple framing questions, you know, am I planning to put these in a book? Do I want to be able to blow them up into larger photos? Um, am I simply looking to share them digitally with friends and family and keep them the same size? That's just going to impact um, some of the resolution settings that you're doing, how, some of the formats that you're choosing when you're saving them, you know, you're, you're gonna be wanting to go with higher resolutions and higher quality formats if you're trying to expand them. So just thinking through what your intentions are as you're starting these digitization projects because you only wanna do it once. So uh, you're gonna to wanna to start with preparing the scanner, your documents, your photos, making sure that the scanner glass is clean, no smudges or anything that's gonna interfere with the scan, uh, making sure the photograph itself is clear of any tape or you know, any insidious things that got onto it, removing any dirt or detritus that you feel comfortable removing without the aid of a conservator. Um, and I know that Dana had a great list of conservators uh, as a resource if you do need help with it only do what's comfortable without destroying it. Um, digitization can be tedious and making sure everything is the best quality the first time you scan it will help you minimize the chance of ever having to rescan it. Um, choosing your settings on your scanner, DPI and PPI, which is dots per inch and pixels per inch, are basically measures of the sharpness of an image. So the more dots or pixels packed into an inch, uh, the finer the image, but also, the larger the file size. Uh, so the higher this quality is, the better it's going to endure later format migrations. Like I said, formats will change and you will have to migrate these in the future very likely. Um, in general, if something is a four by six or a five by seven, I'd say like minimum 300 DPI. This is getting a, a little nitty gritty. Um, but if you're ever planning on enlarging those things, go with a higher DPI because as those get bigger, if you're trying to stretch something beyond what it was, it's gonna start pixelating. Um, when you go to save the photograph, use open, widely available formats like JPEG or TIFF. Um, the biggest difference here is TIFF is a really large file size. Uh, it's a great preservation format, but they take up a lot of storage space and they're bigger files to open, which means that they can take longer to open. So if you're putting them on a website, it, that could take a lot of time to load. If, and it even might have a cap of how, many, how much stuff you can load. If you save your scans as JPEGs and you're trying to put them on a website or something, they'll load faster and they won't take as much hard drive space. If you're doing anything with commercial work or you're, you're like, oh, I want this family photo to be blown up for someone's anniversary or something, TIFF is gonna be a better option. Um, if you just wanna archive your scans and share them with people, 
JPEGs could be fine. JPEG 2000, um, if you have the option, it's an update on the JPEG format standard. Um, I don't know that it's always offered through every application. It does have more efficient compression, so you're getting a smaller size, but cons more consistency across applications and better clarity. We have units, uh, we have uh, libraries at Harvard, within the Harvard Library that sometimes choose a JPEG 2000 as their preservation master instead of a TIFF to save for storage size. So it's acceptable. And you really just have to think about what you wanna do with it, what you're trying to do with it in the future and how much storage space you have. Once, once you've got it saved, um, you wanna give the individual photos descriptive file names so that it's gonna be easy for you to find because you're making, you're gonna have a lot of different photos and you wanna be able to find them later. So instead of IMG 726, which isn't gonna be helpful to you if you wanna search for that photo, you can try different ways um, like month, day, year format or activity name. This is actually um, an example. Well, this is a directory structure example, which I'll get to in a second. But um, I'd say the three priorities when creating the folder structure and the names are think about what's gonna be clear and what you can do consistently. Number two, what's gonna be easy for you to recognize when you go to search for it again. And number three, if you're passing this collection on in the future, if you're passing this down to family members or to a cultural heritage institution, what's gonna be easy for others to recognize and, and discern when they're going through these things? Um, you can use Things like iPhoto or Adobe Lighthouse, whatever you're using to edit these, you can tag photos with names and people and put in descriptive subjects. That's all going to make these photos easier to search for. And you want a really straightforward directory structure. Again, something that will be consistent and easy for you and other people to navigate. <clears throat> and finally, um, if you can see, there's a final arrow. My, my pictures are over there. <clears throat> you want to save multiple copies of your photographs after you've digitized them on a variety of different storage media and you want to keep them in different locations. So I'm going to be on the next slide, I'm going to get into the more digital preservation part of it and that's a good practice. Um, and then whatever you chose, if you chose JPEG or TIFF, you're going to want to keep an eye out into the future on if you start seeing those formats wane in popularity you're gonna do need to do a, a format migration and resave all of those as a new format so that you can continue to have access to them. So you've done all that work digitizing your photos uh, or you have thousands of digital photos already on your phone and um, from your digital cameras. Um, I'm gonna review some steps that you can take to ensure that those stay safe. <clears throat> because people often digitize their photos to preserve them, but unless we take additional steps, those digital surrogates aren't any safer than the artifacts you digitized in the first place. Um, I like a quote, uh, Trevor Owens, who's the head of digital content management, the Library of Congress says, uh, nothing has been preserved. There are only things being preserved. It's an ongoing activity, a continuous commitment. So first of all, um, for all your, your digitized stuff and your born digital stuff, your documents, um, your audio tracks, your photos, your emails, anything that you want to make sure persists um, into the future, you wanna locate everything. You know, do you have pictures on a website or on a thumb drive? Make sure you know where all of your stuff is. That's just the first step. Locate it all and see if you can get it into one spot, like bringing everything together and all your content together because that's gonna make it easier to start backing it up from there. Um, number two, you get to be, you get to play rather a uh, curator of your collections. So <laughs> if you have 10 different shots of the same attempt, attempt at like catching your cat yawning, which I have so many of those, I'm terrible at this part, uh, choose your favorite one to two. And if you feel comfortable parting with the rest, delete them, you know, becoming the curator of your own collection, because all of those photos that you don't care about and that aren't good quality are going to accumulate and they're gonna take up a lot of unnecessary space and it's gonna make it difficult for you to go back and dig out the quality ones that you're looking for. Um, 
step three, organize. Make sure the file names themselves have clear names. Again, you can go with um, a month, year, date, or activity, you know, whatever is going to make sense organizationally for you and for others. And then whatever photo organization database you're using, um, like I said, if you have a Mac, it might be iPhotos or Apple Photos or whatever it's called. Um, I have a photographer friend that loves using Adobe Lightroom um, for editing and for organizing. You can select a single photo or a group of photos and you can enrich those photos with more information. Um, you can often add description or keywords. Um, and that's, again, going to vastly increase your future access to this photo, making sure that you can find it again in the sea of thousands of photos that we generate with our phones or digital cameras. This is metadata. You're, you're basically adding data about your piece of data. You're adding information about your picture, and that's metadata, and now you're a digital archivist. Um, for copy, in digital preservation, we have this acronym called LOCKS. It just, lots of copies keep stuff safe. A minimum of two copies, more is better, and save them in different locations. That way that you're, you're minimizing any one point of vulnerability, like I said earlier. So if you have two copies, but they're just on your laptop in your external hard drive, and that external hard drive sitting right next to it in your basement office, and your basement floods, uh, both copies are gone, and you've you know, lost all of your treasured memories. <laughs> um, cultural heritage institutions, some of them um, take it a step further. We diversify geographically by, um, by areas that have different, uh, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Uh, uh, bad weather. <laughs> That's not the term. I'm blanking on the term. It's basically if one area is, is a, you know, you could have tornadoes and another area has hurricanes, you're going to put them in those two different areas. You don't want to put them in areas that both are susceptible to earthquakes, for instance. So, you know, we might have a copy on the East Coast. We might have servers with other copies out on the West Coast or in the middle of the country or in a different country. We really go far. You don't, you don't have to go that far. <laughs> but... Um, having them in different locations, even if it's just, um, you know, I know some people that keep an external hard drive at their office or at a, a family member's house, you know, because of something, if all of your copies are in your house and something happens, they're gone. And finally, um, manage. You want to go back and make sure that you can open them and use them if, like I said before, if a format that you've been using for years is beginning to wane in popularity, then it's a sign that it might be becoming obsolete and you want to resave all those files in a new high quality format. Um, and also, finally, uh, what's funny is just as creating a digital surrogate of a physical photo is a way to help preserve the physical photographs, Printing a digital photo is another great way to create a differently formatted backup of a photo. It just diversifies the risks that could compromise that intellectual content. So um, I actually, I was wondering the best way I should have asked you about this beforehand, Brian. I, I have links to uh, the Library of Congress has a really great personal digital archiving um, thing for folks. Uh, I have this cute playlist of people. This is just all stuff that people could like dig into if they wanted to learn more. And there's also, um, I don't have a link for this, but you can look it up because it's different every year. There is a personal digital archiving conference that professionals go to, but it's also open to hobbyists or family historians. If any of you are just like, oh, this is riveting information. I want to know more. I want to become an expert on it. They have this every year. I think this year it was um, postponed, but it'll be held again next year as well. <clears throat> So Tricia, I, if yes. you send them to me, I will email everyone who registered Lovely. For, for the talk. That's great. I will email them to you. Um, we have about five pre-submitted questions. So scratch my throat. <clears throat> it's, I was going to make the joke that everyone makes when they cough nowadays, but I'm not going to. <laughs> um, Really, five really great pre-submitted questions that are going to help me elaborate on some of this stuff and kind of have a use case. But we're basically in the Q&A part, too. So after those are done, any other questions that people have, I'd be happy to address them. So um, 
Ralph has a great question about how to preserve raw file formats and associated edits. Um, says, I, I generally shoot digital photos in raw format, edit them using Capture One. Typically, I'll export them as either JPEG or TIFF formats for display and printing. I realize that raw formats are proprietary and the editing software changes frequently. You're absolutely right, Ralph. Um, what are ways to preserve access to the raw files and edits made by them? And otherwise, what do you recommend? So uh, you, I want to say that you are thinking all the right things, Ralph. <laughs> you're saving them as uh, TIFFs and JPEGs, and you're aware that it's proprietary format and that it's more at risk. So that's great. Um, <clears throat> raw formats are proprietary, and to preserve access to those, you're going to have to maintain versions of any proprietary software that renders them. So exporting at whatever high quality preservation master that you want to create is a great step, your TIFF or your JPEG for access, um, depending on your needs and storage resources. But if you have um, the additional storage space, I'd encourage you to keep your raw files. Um, as long as you're able to retain access to them via uh, the software that you're using, you can avoid generational loss um, you know, in case you need to recreate JPEGs, you can do it directly from the original as long as you have them. If eventually they're gone, great, you still have a TIFF. Um, but in our digital preservation repository, we often have multiple formats of a single intellectual object that plays different roles. So in this case, you'd have the one photo, you know, it's, a, it's the same photo visually, but we would have uh, a raw, and we would have that in the original, it's the original. Um, we'd export a TIFF as a very high quality preservation copy, copy that would support um, format migrations down the line. And then we'd also have a compressed JPEG for an access copy that's easy to upload to a website or send to a researcher. Um, so the benefit of keeping the raw file is that if the format winds change direction and a different format gains widespread use and popularity, you can still utilize the editing software if it's still available to open that raw file and then just generate the new format. Um, yeah, so uh, if you don't want to part with it and you have the storage space, keep it. You just need to make sure that you can still open it with whatever software you're using and then keep generating those TIFFs because um, if, you know, they're, they're any proprietary format because it's closed and not as many people can um, participate in the documentation of it and create applications that support it. It's just a, a more volatile format in general, but you already seem aware of that. So you're doing great. Um, Jim, taking advantage of their current stay at home period to organize all their family photos, many going back to the 1800s, that's amazing. And uh, wanting to know best scanning methods, naming of files and where to store them. I have a couple of friends that are doing the same thing. I think it's just to, Great, a really great use of time right now. Um, so I'll reiterate some of the stuff I talked about earlier, making sure that the scanning bed is clean, that the photograph is clean, using all of Dana's wonderful guidance on handling them. Um, the higher quality you scan at, the better the preservation master is, and it's better if you need to reprint it, so a high quality uh, TIFF or JPEG, but it'll take up a lot of space, so if you're limited in the amount of storage space that you have, uh, compromise on saving a medium quality JPEG um, if you're not looking to reprint. If you're looking to reprint, go with a higher quality. Uh, favor those open formats, JPEG and TIFF, and when you store them, straightforward directory structure, my pictures, 2020, quarantine 2020. <laughs> I don't have a lot of pictures from quarantine 2020. Something that's gonna be easy for you to understand when you need to find them later and for others to understand if you pass the stewardship of your collection onto someone else. Um, and finally, reiterating locks, lots of copies, keep stuff safe. Um, two copies at least, more is better. Diversify your storage media, uh, maybe a copy on your laptop, a copy on your external, and a copy in the cloud. That can be a security risk if you're not comfortable with it, uh, another external that you store at someone else's house. That's the best case scenario. Um, you may have noticed earlier I didn't call it best practices. I called it good practices. I really think that um, if you set the bar too high and people can't achieve it, then sometimes they won't do anything at all. Do what you're able to do.
Um, yeah. Next question, um, and I think that this actually popped up in Dana's uh, seminar, and she received this question originally. She passed it on to me, so thank you, Dana. Um, basically, uh, Ricardo, you have tons, you have 60 print albums, um, black and white prints from the early 1900s in Poland, amazing. Um, some 35 millimeter negatives, many of which didn't make it to print. What's the way to digitize all of these? So um, I wanted to start, something that popped out to me was this idea of only the keeper images made it to the albums. Um, so if you're interested in digitizing all of these things yourself, um, they, they do have 30, 35 millimeter like uh, scanning bed slides that, that's it. So I think those are really cool. But I would urge you to kind of think through whether or not, you know, again, being your own curator, if only these keeper images made it to the albums, do you want those? Or are they, are they the old version? I mean, may, you might very well want them. But are, are they, you know, really like looking at those images and deciding like, do I want to uh, steward these into the future? Curating your collection and making it a manageable size um, is just something to think through and keep in mind. Um, you did mention, you said, <laughs> you said that um, taking the time to scan all these albums, you know, one scan with a decent pixel size takes a long time. It required months of scanning to include all the albums. Um, it does, it takes a lot of time. I have, like I mentioned, a couple of friends spending their whole quarantine on this. So I thought that this was um, a good time to maybe mention that there are companies that you can pay to take care of digitizing all your photographs. If this is just like too overwhelming of a project, um, I haven't used them personally. I can't vouch for them. Uh, I'm not sure how much they cost even, but a couple of them, um, Legacy Box, Ever present and eye memories are among some that will digitize and organize a really wide range of physical formats for you if you wanted to hand everything off. Um, so if you're going to do it yourself, following those digitization guidelines that I introduced earlier and then storing them and continuing to make sure that they're preserved afterwards, but you can hand it off to someone else too if, if money is not an issue. Um, Chris, thank you so much for this question. I haven't explicitly addressed this yet, so you've given me a great opportunity. So um, where to keep whatever storage devices one has digital materials on? So once it's on that external hard drive or thumb drive, where do you want to keep it to be perfectly safe? So the priorities for safeguarding your drives um, and, and really anything that you're keeping your media on uh, you're looking to avoid physical damage. So um, in which case a, a fireproof file cabinet may well be a fine storage space for your external medium, but you can extend the life of a drive, for instance, by keeping it away from dust and fire and water and power fluctuation. You wanna treat it like a mogwai. You know, don't feed it after midnight. Um, I haven't used them personally, but there are also programs that monitor external hard drive health. Um, there's an acronym called SMART, Self-Monitoring Analysis and Reporting Technology, and it's a way to gauge the health of your hard drive. So uh, I would encourage you, I don't, I don't have a, a link to this, but if you just use a search engine to say SMART, uh, it's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T, hard drive, you can probably find out how to run it on your drive. And it's just a way of monitoring, like, because like I mentioned earlier, you don't often see signs that a drive is about to fail, um, but you can kind of anticipate it with, by using smart. I, I actually don't use it myself, but it could be handy. Um, don't overload all, don't use every single drop of the space that you have on your external. You, if you have like a five terabyte drive, don't use all five terabytes. Uh, if you fill it up completely with your data, it's getting more wear and tear. So give it a little breathing room and uh, handle it with care. Don't unplug it abruptly or let it overheat. Um, but yeah, just generally keep keep it away from keep it away from the bad stuff. Um, you don't want it to overheat. Uh, fire is bad. Dust is bad, etc. 
And this was an interesting one. I've been looking at getting a photo stick and one site says album saver is the easiest to use. Uh, Debbie, I haven't used one of these before and so I did some digging around and it sounds like the appeal is that it's a handy way to quickly back up your photos. Um, it sounds, you know, it's, it looks like a thumb drive and it says it can save all of your, you know, back up all your photos. It looks handy and maybe like a great option for backing stuff up while you're on vacation, for instance. Um, I can't vouch for Album Saver having never used it personally, but I wouldn't necessarily discourage you from purchasing it and using it as additional storage. Um, I would simply reiterate to not rely on it as your only backup. Don't let that be your only <laughs> way that you're backing up your photos. Um, definitely also have another external hard drive or cloud storage backing up those photos, um, minimum two, preferably more. Yeah. All right. Look at that. So Trisha, Patrick has a great question and it gets back to kind of the first part of your talk. Mm. Um, he asks, um, you touched on the digital dark ages in the introduction. Other than the things you mentioned in your talk, is there anything we can do to keep our cultural memory safe for future generations? And he mm. also goes on to ask, um, he was wondering to what extent do you think it makes sense to keep analog hard copies? Um, I'm, maybe I'll start with the first or the second question, which to what extent do I think it makes sense to keep analog hard copies? Um, kind of going back to what I said about, uh, you know, digitizing stuff as, as Dana mentioned is a great way to pr further preserve your physical copy and creating a hard copy is a great way to just make sure you have another format of your digital copy. Um, if you have the space to preserve both, I would. It just gives you more insurance that you're, that if something happens on either side, you've still got that treasured memory. Um, so, uh, if, if you if you don't, definitely make sure that once you've digitized it, that you are following um, all the good practices for making sure that you don't lose that digital copy. Because if you toss out the physical copy and then all oh, your digital copies are gone too, that's going to be very sad. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the first question, could, Brian, could you uh, reread that? Like, what can people do? Yeah, yeah. So you touched on the digital dark ages mm -hmm. in the introduction. Other than the things you've already mentioned in your talk, is there anything else you, I, any of us can do to keep our cultural memory safe for future generations? Well, I, you know, by preserving your own things and by following, you know, just good practices of preserving your own things, you are helping to make sure that we have a more complete picture of history for the future. You, the things that we rely on for our public um, memory now were once, you know, the public's safe safeguarded treasures that they had in their home, their, their physical pictures and letters that they wrote and things like that. So, so I would urge you to preserve these things so that we have a more complete visual of our record in the future. Um, there are, if you really want to get um, more engaged in stuff, um, you could always look at volunteer opportunities at community archives and things like that. And, and you know, just like look for ways that you can actually participate in that stuff. And I would encourage you to take the stuff here that you're learning. And if you continue to learn more and advocate to other people, I got to say, my husband's in a band and he and his uh, bandmates, they've been doing all these laying down some hot recording tracks or something. <laughs> and then they told me the other day what they were doing, which is um, they didn't want to pay for storage. So they were just continuing to open new Google accounts every time they ran out of storage so that they could save it on their Google drive. And I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> you know, it's just like, okay, I'm just going to sit down with you guys and educate you right now. If you, when you know, when you see people um, practicing bad digital preservation hygiene, gently encourage them and, and let them know that, like, you know, these are, you know, people. We lose a lot of stuff this way, and um, you can really support the historical record by safeguarding your things. Yeah, and Warren asks um, something kind of relevant you were talking about, passing it along, obviously. Um, you know, 
how do you prepare all of that stuff when you do give it to the next generation? And he, he writes, um, one item that is often overlooked with individual uh, digital preservation is handling what happens if you die. Uh, it is important to leave behind readily findable and accessible information about what you have, where it resides, how to access it, any relevant passwords. Um, you know, without access, it is lost, even if it's technically on a disk. Do you have any other kind of tips to safeguard, you know, access? This person taught it for me. <laughs> Warren yeah. Bonner. I'm so glad that you mentioned that. Thank you, Warren. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because yes, you're absolutely right that um, it's not it's not in boxes somewhere that people are gonna happen upon. Make sure that that stuff is really, um, easily communicated to someone if it's password protected and where it is and how they're going to be able to access it. Thank you for bringing that up. I'm that um, making sure your passwords are evident to someone else than you and that, that, um, and maybe also communicating your wishes that like, I, I wish for this stuff to be seen because I think a lot of times people are concerned with privacy. So being really explicit, um, I mean, it's good that they're concerned with privacy, <laughs> but uh, being explicit about like, yes, I want these things to be passed on and I don't want these things to be passed on. <laughs> don't worry about this password protected stuff. I'm not giving you that password, but these stuff that, you know, I gave you the password for, please continue to safeguard it. And this is how maybe give them a little digital preservation guide. <laughs> So Meg Jackson Fox asks a question and then we'll get into some more specific technical stuff, but do you have recommendations for best practices or good practices um, in preserving web developed and therefore web living content for, for example, like an online community archive or blogs? How, how do you go about preserving that? So um, some of you may have heard before of the Internet Archive and I'm going to Right. As soon as I mention that, I'm going to mention that a lot of people, if they have heard of it, they're like, yeah, they preserve everything. They do not preserve everything on the web. But uh, one option is to uh, nominate something that you think is important uh, through them so that they do preserve it because um, web archiving is very important. <laughs> so much of our news and so, so, so many movements that happen are all through the internet now, through social media and the web. And that was another really big risk for a while. And I mean, it still is a risk, but at least people, cultural heritage institutions are engaging with a lot more. And um, I would definitely encourage you if you have like a, a, some kind of community thing, talk to your local community archive or talk to your local public library um, or nominate yourself to the internet archive that that should be crawled. There are, if you are more um, technologically capable, there are ways of crawling websites yourself um, and, and doing web archiving yourself and saving uh, the format that we use currently for web archiving preservation copies is a WARC. It's a W-A-R-C format. Um, and, and there are some tools out there. And, and I'd encourage you to actually email me if you wanted to find more out about doing that part, um, because I can point you to a couple of different tools. But um, yeah, you can do it yourself, but start with the Internet Archive or your local community archive and see if, you know, like, hey, I think this is important. What do you think about preserving it? So getting a little more technical, um, how long do the memory cards typically last? Um, and do oh. ones made more recently with more storage megabytes, gigabytes, do they last better than older ones? Memory cards for, for digital cameras? Yeah, or just kind of like thumb drives. What do, you, what do you think? You know, gosh, that's a good question. I don't want to put any promises out there. Um, in general, we have become um, better about creating drives, uh, solid state drives, for instance, and, and I'm talking more about ex ex external and computer drives right now. Um, last generally longer than uh, spinning disk drives used to. To that extent, I don't know specifically about what the hardware technology looks like in uh, photo card memories. I had imagined that they are better, uh, but don't just rely on them. <laughs> Regardless of how good anything looks uh, or any kind of guarantee it makes, just don't rely on just that. And, um, and, 
duplicate all of your copies. Uh, so that's that's not very helpful about, you know, I can't say like, actually, yes, there, the technology behind this has improved drastically. Um, it's probably improved, still make additional copies. So um, Sapria asks, um, is there any particular brand? I don't know if you can give this recommendation, but is there any particular brand of external hard drives that you recommend? She I I don't, honestly, when I go to get an external hard drive, so, uh, you know, as, as at a cultural heritage institution, we go through, um, when we're looking at getting new drives, we, we don't look for brands of drives. We just will say like, well, we're looking for a compilation of spinning disk drives and tape drives and all of this, and we want them in these things. And, and then we ask people to come to us and give us quotes. Um, as a consumer myself, practicing personal digital archiving, I don't have a, a specific one that I like. Solid state drives can last longer. I still wouldn't just depend on them, um, but they're more expensive. And I do what any consumer does. I go on, I see what has um, a lot of really good reviews. I go on to tech watch reports and say like, what's good right now? Because things are just, it's technology. It's constantly changing. The last time, um, my last external, I personally have an external and cloud backups. Um, I should have more. <laughs> And I let my last external I got two years ago. So in a couple more years, I'll probably um, refresh that and I'll just look for what's recommended at the time. I'll go to, you know, consumer reports and look at reviews and see what looks good. So, so I could be more specific. And you, you were touching upon um, cloud backup services. What, what do you think of them? Uh, again, are there how like just like you're chopping around reviews for physical drives? What what is your advice when it comes to finding a cloud backup service that is so? Not? Yeah, I you know um, it, that really depends on how how concerned someone is about privacy. Cloud mm -hmm. has privacy risks. Uh, you know, at uh, my institution. We do our access copies, so our, our compressed smaller files that we use as deliverables, all of that is on the cloud now, but we don't put our preservation copies on the cloud. Um, in my personal life, I do, I use Dropbox. Uh, it just happens to be easy, you know, a combination of ease and, and cheapness for me. Um, not everyone would necessarily feel secure with that. I wouldn't push cloud on anyone because people have been hacked. Um, celebrities have been hacked. I, I'm not being uh, you know, a celebrity myself. I'm not particularly concerned about it, um, but I can tend to be a little laissez-faire about that. If, if you're concerned about security stuff at all, um, that might not be the way for you to go. Um, but there are, you know, uh, Apple has its own proprietary one and Dropbox has one and Google has one. And um, I think that they're there's so many options out there nowadays for cloud stuff, if you're comfortable with the risk. Just a couple more. John asks, uh, do you consider Adobe's DNG format to be proprietary or open and thus suitable for long-term storage? Or you know, oh, that's, um, I, I wouldn't, I, I would, I would not use it for, um, my only format. I would still look to a TIFF or a JPEG. Those are by and far the, the at least have one of those formats. But similar to the earlier question with the raw format, if you have the space, keep it. Um, there's nothing wrong with keeping that additional format as long as you're making sure that you also have uh, a really high quality TIFF or JPEG because those are, they've just been around longer and they're going to likely to continue to be around for a while a, a bit longer um, and so you're just you know they're they're really open and really well documented and that's the important part is if a format or a piece of software is open and well documented it means that a lot of people can create applications that work with it um, so that's when we talk about open versus proprietary that that can be there are open proprietary formats um, that, you know, they're like, oh, here's the code if, you know, we own it, but if people want to make things that work with it, great. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd still say TIFF and JPEG are your best bet and keep the DMG if you want to. Uh, it's not a bad thing to keep it, certainly. 
And then at last is a comment from Warren, and I think he brings up a really interesting idea. When deciding whether to keep some photos, especially old ones of unknown subjects, it is worth noting that technology is changing rapidly, as is the ability to uh, identify and correlate images. So an image of an unknown person in an unknown location today may actually become more identifiable in the future and therefore more valuable to retain. That's Thank you, Warren. Wonderful. Yeah. I wish Warren was co-teaching this with me. He's great. Like, I, I just, like, you've got so much good information. I'm really glad that you brought that up. That is so great. We, like, with technology, you know, there are, um, there are so many challenges that it presents us with, but so many opportunities as well. And that is such a great one to point out. Um, so thank you. Trisha, thank you so very much. Thank I you. appreciate it. Um, this has been wonderful. And I think we learned a lot, I think, all of us, Good. Uh, all of us at the <laughs> center um, and all of our, our guests or our um, folks watching. So thank you so much for joining us and, and thank you um, to our members and our director circle members and um, all of this wonderful information um, is going to be uploaded to the YouTube, uh, the center's YouTube channel in about a week. We have to get captioning and all of that. Um, but uh, look for it there um, to kind of uh, get, uh, have that information again. So Trisha, thank you so very much. Thank you all so much. Thanks for letting me babble on about this stuff. I'm so glad that people were interested. <laughs> that was wonderful. Have a lovely and safe evening, everyone. And we will see you in the next uh, CCP live event. Can't wait. Bye. Bye-bye.